This is Talking Hardcore, the podcast for people who love hardcore history. We can skip the boring to the interesting stuff. Worst person in the world in history, Genghis Khan. Uh, anyway, I've met his wife. She's not gonna she, she, my wife doesn't listen to this, and she likes me more than his wife likes him. She, <laughs> yeah, right. Is that because aliens crashed and stole their technology? Oh, nice. I was You're listening to Talking Hardcore, and this is what, episode 12? <laughs> episode 12, yep. Right, and we have a special guest today. This is our first uh, interview podcast like this, and uh, we have Matt. I'm sorry, Matt, what did you say your last name was? Bella. Bella, okay, and he's a science fiction author, and he's the one that started the Hardcore History Discord channel. I'm George. I'm Scott. And thanks for listening and watching. Okay. So, Matt, let's let's talk about the Discord ch- uh, channel first. How long ago did you start that? It was probably about a year ago. Cool. And this got, you got a pretty good amount of people on there. Yeah, I was trying to promote it, and um, there's a Facebook, like, Hardcore History page, and there's another one on Reddit. The one on Reddit uh, took forever to, like, accept a submission for posting but once i got accepted into posting on facebook boom i got like a million followers immediately oh that's cool nice that's cool yeah i mean i really find that is a useful thing so yeah, I started, when did I you it, i'm sorry go ahead. go ahead no you go ahead yeah I, I started it just because i wanted to do exactly what you guys are doing talk about hardcore history man you know what i mean there's so much more there i wanted to meet like minds i wanted to meet people who have personal um, personal connections to these stories, and it was mm-hmm. just amazing when you popped up, and you know, you guys were doing the podcast, I was doing the server. It was a perfect merger to me. I was just like, let's do this thing, man. Right. We started the podcast, and then I found your Discord channel the next day, and I was like, oh shit, this is awesome. That's, That's literally crazy. how it happened. Or, it was, yeah. No, go ahead. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> when did you start listening to Hardcore History? Uh, right about in 2011, um, my older brother inst- introduced me to it. My my brother David, shout out if you're listening to this. Um, he's five years older than me, so you know basically just one step ahead in the generation thing. And he loved history. Uh, he read a lot about it. Fell in love with you know Alexander the Great and all the the classic epic stories. Um, and he passed it on to me as a kid. And you know when I was a kid, I got into whatever, like maybe the kids version of that. And then the adolescent version of that. And then the adult version of that probably tailed off for a while as I got more into science fiction and things. Mm -hmm. Um, and then right about, I believe it was 2011. He sent me, um, a link to hardcore history. And he's like, dude, you got to check this out. And I was immediately hooked. My first experience. Yeah. Yeah. My, yeah, it was, it was, yeah. So my, my first experience was, uh, ghost of the Ost front. And that, after that, I was just, I was addicted. I was addicted. I mean, that, it's that's it's, a hell of a one to start on. Yeah, that's a good series. Yeah. What is a monument? Right? Like it's yeah. just I've looked at that series a be- hundred times, and yeah, not, from that just revitalized my love for history. Um, it's completely consumed my life now um, in a healthy way. Um, it, right. It's changed my life for the better, uh, learning things. It's influenced my own work and writing as far as authentic, authenticity and the lessons I'm trying to pass along. Dan's work has provided real practical information that I use in my writing and um, in various topics as well. I mean, the Mongols are cool. The Persian Empire are, are, are cool. I like seeing it in Wrath of the uh, in, um, in King of Kings. I like seeing the story of, you know, everybody wants Dan to do the Alexander the Great series, right? Like, that's his big mm-hmm. one. And at this point, I think he's just holding it back until he retires. You know, he'll give it to Yeah, until he's ready to be done. Just... He's going to shoot off, right. hit that one, and be just walk off into the sunset. <laughs> he knows we want it so bad. But, it's, he but will he it ever before. retire? Right now, right? Hopefully not. Dan, if you're Probably listening. Not. 72 yeah. years old, episode of 4,000. Um, yeah. But he has provided a bit of Alexander from the Persian perspective, which I think is more hardcore. Like, if you ever watched that movie Letters from Iwo Jima that shot from the Japanese perspective, and then yeah. they show American Marines storming the beach, but it's not from the American perspective. You just see the Marines as the enemy, right? And they're right. more terrifying like that. Like, that's how he showed sure. us Alexander. Um, oh, yeah. I like seeing how much 
like that. But uh, Ghost of the Ostfront really ignited in me just this immense realization of of the impact of that war on civilization. Um, the the line from that that really stands out to me is uh, if you took the the war on the Eastern Front and separated it completely from the Second World War, it would still be the largest war in human history. And, yeah, you know, it was, for it's, sure. It, an, 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 an yeah. immense conflict. You know, I'm starting to recite Dan word for word here. No, but, but I uh, hear you because, and it's funny because your story is very similar to mine. I I loved history growing up. I majored in history in college, and then you start getting involved in your day to day life. I read a lot of fiction, and then starting to listen to hardcore history when I found that probably like six or seven years ago, it drew me back to history in a way that. I hadn't been excited about it since I was a kid. Totally. You know, I went to college and you major in it and it's all boring stuff. Like I didn't have a single professor that saw history the way Dan did. You know, when he talks about how we get focused on teaching, you know, the day to day life now or the great man theory and, and you get all that. Well, I was in college right when it was all about the minutia, the day to day. And it was more about archaeology and, and anthropology than 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 history, and it was it was boring. For, <laughs> like, and it shouldn't be. History should never be boring. It is not, drama. It's not. That's what my brother used to say. It says he says when you read history, you don't need to watch movies. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, even Dan says the same thing that uh, like the story of Alexander the Great ruined ruined fiction for him. Right. Uh, <laughs> because he was. Yeah, I mean, which is funny because I mean he's got it's got everything right yeah um, and uh, the yeah. funny thing is you mentioned uh, letters letters from Iwo Jima uh, I believe Clint Eastwood directed that right yeah, I, I, I think he also did um, was it Flags of Our Fathers didn't he do yeah. that from the American perspective exactly yeah they're, they're both good movie great movies yeah. great movies yeah. to watch I, I was telling yeah. uh, I was telling George uh, before the show that um, there's this great interview that I'm listening to right now with a 98-year-old veteran of the Second World War, former Marine, Battle of Iwo Jima. And he talks about the like being inspired to be a Marine, like, you know, by the movies that were back then. Really, it was Roosevelt's speech, the attack at Pearl Harbor, that sent him literally running down to the recruiter's office. Um, a 98-year-old guy telling his story still alive. Yeah. I got to yeah, listen yeah. to that. He shared it I, in the Discord channel. Which it's again, amazing. there'll be a link in the description to this episode to that, and you can find it there because I gotta listen to that. That sounds amazing. It really is amazing. And he said that uh, he doesn't like many of the Hollywood movies that come out nowadays, but he said the one move, the one movie he said was Letters from Iwo Jima. And you know why he wow. said that? He said because it shows how the Japanese were fighting then. They were lied to. They were told it was a holy war, and so they would fight to the death. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they were brainwashed just like any other, almost like a cult. I mean, and that's why you really, when you have that background and you understand that, then you really don't, you don't demonize Truman. Like, when you have those facts, how could you blame him for what he did? Oppenheimer just came out, and there is that discussion going around, right? I think— Yeah. Dan has helped me. On, okay, here is a very personal connection from Dan Carlin to the dropping of the atomic bomb. Okay, his right. stepfather, who he cites as being really more of his father, you know, the name influential, Dan. yeah. Right, right, right. He was um, uh, in the Navy uh, during the Second World War, and he was on one of these patrol ships that would look for submarines. And he mm -hmm. remembers his, his stepdad, uh, or his, I'm, I'm sorry, his stepdad, yeah, telling him um, just how yeah. terrified. Yeah. It was the last days of the war, right? You know what I mean? They didn't know that yet. Mm -hmm. But he was terrified for his own life. Every man shared that fear. And yeah. that was just the one on the ocean, let alone the right. estimated one million casualties that America and the Allies would have suffered with a physical invasion of the islands. And we, yeah. it's not like we were dropping leaflets and sending them pantyhose and Levi's before that. Napalm was invent. We were firebombing their cities. Napalm right. was invented. For the second world war houses right. made of paper and wood the stories of the firebombing of japan are equally as horrific if not more than the exactly the bomb. and people exactly. look at the events of the dropping of the atomic bombs as their own and their atrocities and it, there's absolutely 
that case to be made, why don't you go back and look what was happening until the day up before we did that? <clears throat> right. Yeah. Exactly. If you put it in context, it makes perfect sense. I did see Oppenheimer, and I don't think you came away from that movie, at least I did not come away from that movie, like thinking it was an anti atomic bomb, anti American movie. I thought Nolan did a decent job telling the story, and I could understand why Oppenheimer might feel guilt as he got older in life, just because. I think that's probably a natural human reaction to the the things that happened in his life and the dropping of the atomic bomb. I could see why that might cause him to feel guilt, even though he knew it saved American lives. And I thought the movie did a decent job of kind of trying to tell the story that way. So I, I think I think uh, what Oppenheimer might have felt more guilt about was the the. What, what's the very ending of that movie? I'm, I'm not going to spoil it because if you read American Prometheus, which I haven't, but it's kind of there in the history. There's also that the rest of history series on Oppenheimer. So this stuff is out there. Um, right. The effect, the long ranging effects of 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 the bomb on arms races, on geopolitics, on the way right. we consider. Yeah, that's kind of that? how the movie ends. You're right. But right. Right. I don't see how you could look at the long ranging effects of the bomb and not see it as a positive for human history right it now. Kind of, kind of has helped. And let's not, let's not forget that throughout the, uh, throughout the majority of the development of the atomic bomb, it was meant to be dropped on Berlin. They were a threat to the world. The Nazis right. were a threat to the world, right? The J Japan, Japan was invading mainland China. They were our great enemy because they attacked us and we had to go over there and fight them. But right. I think if we dropped the bomb on Berlin, it would have been a completely different conversation in the world. Well, and actually, that, that brings up to a point that George and I discussed, if you don't mind if I interject here. No, go ahead. Um, George asked me the question, do I think that the atomic bomb changed the way the Cold War was fought after World War II ended? Or would... World War II just have kept going if it wasn't for the atomic bomb when the Red Army was in was in Berlin. Um, you know, it already stormed through most of Europe or, or got into the Berlin and, and right. stopped. Right. So do you think the Russians stopped because we had the atomic bomb or do you think the Russians stopped because that was a good stopping spot after uh, Germany had fallen? Or do you think that without the atomic bomb, World War Three would have happened Right, or just a continuation even, of World War II. Even a year or two later, right? There's an argument there that after Russia gets, his, gets its bearings, settles down for a minute, catches its breath after the crazy four years they'd just been through, you're like, you know what? Let's just take the rest of Europe. We don't think America can stop us. And maybe they wouldn't have. Maybe we wouldn't have been able to. Maybe would have. But without the bomb, that would have been millions of more lives probably. It's there's arguable. A, there's at least a chance. It's right? arguable. Uh, my my point was, you know, the Russians had moles everywhere. So mm -hmm. I, I'm assuming, or at least I, there's evidence that the Russians had moles uh, within, you know, the Manhattan Project, and they knew how many bombs we had. Yeah, they had that one guy. Yeah. I, I can't uh, ever remember his name, but they had. So well, what's what your you thoughts? Yeah, what yeah. Do, you th do you think without nuclear weapons— we would have had a major war with Russia instead of all these little proxy wars. I think okay, so we, you and I, all of us three here, have discussed this at length, private, personally, um, on the server, and there's a huge, fascinating conversation there for anyone who wants to mm -hmm. look at that. I'll try and sum up the points of that, um, because I did sort of learn things and change my mind a bit in the course of that conversation. I, I first of all, zoomed out. Things don't happen. You don't learn the lessons in the moment, and years and years, generations later, you can sign up. See, I think that there needed to be a stopping point to that Titanic conflict. Um, right. For everyone at that point, um, oh, yeah. everyone was exhausted. Now, now we've gone over and over and over about the actual plans for America fighting the Red Army in Europe and how we would have outnumbered them, and we had the tactics and the equipment and the allies, but the resources weren't there. And the most important word of all was not their morale. Um, I, America very much is a, a, a country who does not occupy. 
we go over, we fight, we liberate, and we come home. Immediately after the Second World War, we demobilized. We kept army bases there, you know, we kept navy bases um, to make sure, especially in Japan and Germany, obviously. But what we right. didn't do was keep the land that we liberated, right? Hey, you're welcome, France. Hey, you're welcome, Netherlands. Okay, we'll see you later. We're the good guys. Goodbye. The individual morale of the personal soldier is incredibly important in any such conflict like that. And shifting from defense to offense would have made a huge difference in the way we fought that war and people's motivation to keep going. Would we have needed to keep going had Russia said, okay, guess what? America just did their thing over here. We fought the majority of this war in Europe, like 80 to 90 percent of it, right? And then the Americans are withdrawing. They're keeping a couple of bases, but we can deal with that. In fact, we might be able to reclaim that land. And look, oh, France is right over there. Oh, look, you know, all these countries are right over there. Let's just keep pushing. Who's going to stop us? America, how you feeling? You know, you did your job. That There is a case to be made for that. Um, I, it's interesting. It's just a thought. We'll never know, but it's, a, it's an interesting thing to think about. And he was very much an outlier in in that, you know. I think the general mood of the American military command at that time was was it's over, like we did our thing, right? You know, as far as Russia pushing forward and making it a necessity, that could have happened. They had a a huge army. There was incredibly combat experience. The major great weapons generals. Were, yeah, oh, Dan great Dan generals. Called, Dan calls you called the best general of the war, like hands down. Right. You, Accustomed to battle tested generals, and, right? Yeah, battle tested generals accustomed to commanding 500,000 men in a single battle, like this huge right. Operation Migration, you know, all these kind of things where we had to yeah. bring in Eisenhower, Supreme Commander, and we were, you know, this and that. We did it good, but Russia, I, I think, yeah. honestly, and I said this to you directly, and, and even this conversation hasn't changed it. I think we, we would have got our butts kicked by Russia on the land in Europe, <clears throat> right? I, but then we had the Air Force, we had the Navy, so it, it, that's not a, an end of the – okay. But this is a fascinating discussion, but I don't want this podcast to go down this <laughs> rabbit hole. No, sorry. we got to talk about other stuff too. That's what I do. No, I, no, <laughs> you, you didn't do anything wrong. I, it's fascinating. That's why we're talking to Matt. That's why we're doing the podcast because we like talking about this kind of stuff. Yep. You know, that's just it. This is what fascinates us about history is all these what ifs and things like that. So, Matt, what's your favorite hardcore history episode? It's go, it goes to the off front, off front, hand down, that entire series. Um, maybe the mm -hmm. second or the third one, if I had to pick one out of those. That's you can go series. I, I think it's silly to yeah. – to me, it's silly to break them down by the individual episodes when you go, go series because it's really – those are just long series. One they long are. episode that he split up. Exactly. That's the way I look at it. Nowadays, he's not even trying to – bothering to split them up. They're five-and-a-half-hour episodes, so it goes to the I opera love it. as yeah. a modern episode. And I'll tell you why. It, it just really – it struck me, the total breakdown of civilization. We, I'm a science fiction writer, okay? Like, I write about post – you know, well, sci I, not necessarily – I don't write about post-apocalyptic stuff. I'm interested in it. I read about it. Science fiction, you know, there's a lot of science fiction. Sure. Stuff. We had that for real. We had – the apocalypse for real in Europe, and that was the Eastern Front during the Second World War. <laughs> or the Western Front during the First World War. Yeah, yeah. You uh, know, that's been... similar. It's very similar in that front, like chemical weapons and all that stuff, too. Well, you yeah. still had the Brusilov Offensive on the Eastern Front. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, a million, it... man, a million man charge out of Russia into, you know, against German lines, and they, they just got... I mean, that was, I think that was the first battle the Russians won, but it was due to sheer manpower. Well, that's what the Russians did at the beginning, right? What what they could have even when they, well, anyway, we're not going down this rabbit hole. I'm going to steer us <laughs> somewhere else. So Ghost sure. of the Ops Front is an amazing. I actually just re-listened to that uh, last week um, when I was at, I had a long car ride. So I was, I was listening to that. Uh, Scott, what's your favorite? I, I would have to say Supernova in the East. Um, right yeah, I mean, because it, you know, it touches home, it hits home with some of the things that, you know, my grandfather told me about the war in the Pacific. Sure. Um, I think it's very fascinating. I think the Japanese culture is very fascinating. Um, oh. And also, in you know, the in-depth, how in-depth Dan goes with, um, you know, some of the aircraft carriers, um, some of the key, you know, the crucial battles, Midway, Coral Midway. Sea. Right. Um, definitely. I mean, 
you know, the Aleutian Islands. He even brought up like my, you know, I, my grandfather, I remember him telling me that uh, he was stationed for South Pacific and ended up in the Aleutian Islands. Um, so everybody's in shorts and t-shirts. Right. And I, did I mention this in the, yeah, but it's okay. Go ahead. So anyway, and they ended up in the Aleutian islands because that they, the, the thought process was was the Japanese were going to invade through Alaska down through Canada and into Washington state, which they had warehouses. I mean, he told me a story where, you know, after they had landed all the troops and everything under the shore, um, he and a bunch of buddies like went and raided uh, Japanese warehouses in the Aleutian Islands where he found a phonograph um, and he a phonograph and like bomber jackets, like Fox fur line bomber jackets. Cause everybody was freezing because they were wow. state. Like I said, they were, they were in shorts and t-shirts thinking South Pacific. And he was in, you know, the, the almost in the Arctic. The exact uh, opposite. Right. And uh, my, my grandfather was Hispanic, but they, um, Anyway, long story short, he turned on this phonograph and he had this Japanese bomber jacket on. And one of his colleagues thought, or one of his fellow soldiers thought he was a, a he thought they thought he was Japanese. So they they actually put a gun to his head Whoa. and just shot him because uh, wow. he's sitting there listening to this phonograph, you know, dressed up like a Japanese. Yeah, he was just fire. cold. Yeah, yeah, he's just cold. Uh, yeah. Very interesting. That's fascinating. My favorite, George? my yeah. my favorite is Wrath of the Khans. Right on, man. Or if second favorite, close second is Death Rose of the Republic. Right on. I love all the hardcore histories, but to me, the ones he does about the older stuff, I like them better because isn't that it's how much we can find we know about times that 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 far in the past. Right, that's part of it, right? And that's stuff I know less about, so that always interests me. But also, it's because he gets less into the specific battles. And more into the general flow of history, which is where that I like a little bit of the battle stuff, but I don't like when it's into the weeds like this. But Supernova in the East in the middle episodes got a little bit more into battle heavy military tactics stuff. And that's not as interesting to me as the as the the big picture stuff. So like the part of supernova in the east that's my favorite is the very first episode when he's talking about uh hirohito and and all that stuff that the culture in japan that's my favorite part and then when you get to the end of it when he's talking about the atomic bomb and stuff that's awesome that's what death throws of the republic and wrath of the cons that's almost all it is is that kind of stuff because we don't have enough information about most of those ancient battles to have a a, a 20 or 30 minute monologue about them you know, right. except like we get what in Death Rose of the Republic, you get a few minutes about the Battle of Kani, yeah. you know, which is exactly the right amount for me. But I understand a lot of people who love hardcore history are military aficionados. They're people that are obsessed with that part of the history, whereas I, I love it all. I want to hear the broad strokes as much as I want to hear the detail. There's a lot of the interlinking politics of Roman society and government in Death Rose of the Republic. Yep. That one, I think it's fascinating that we know that much about it. Um, two, that he can string it all together into a, a narrative like that and carry yeah. us places, especially across all the episodes, the long episodes of that, and bring us to a certain destination. And let's remember, mm -hmm. he said he started that entire series as um, a show about Cleopatra. And it was like, exactly. when you heard about Cleopatra, oh, you got to go back, oh, you got to go back. And it ended up being an entire history of the downfall of the Roman Republic. Which is and the funniest story that he tells. Like, <laughs> literally, he talks about Cleopatra for like five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so great. What I like about, I mean, one of the major benefits to me of hardcore history is the extra reading that it inspires. Um, on the server with each episode, um, for most of the episodes so far, and I'm working on all of them, I've posted reading lists. Uh, right. Some of them, some of them are like on his website, and some of them you can find by searching, you know, this, uh, you know, that episode. But I tried to provide the reading list that he did for research, and with Supernova in the East, um, that inspired for me a whole slew of reading about uh, war memoirs from the Second World War, uh, specifically in the East and, and the, in the Pacific Theater. And one of cool. them was the war memoir of a Marine, Eugene Sledge. It's called With the Old Breed. I was thinking of it today when I was listening to that interview. And the people, those are the things those people went through 
um, Iwo Jima, just, you know, that, that name has a certain connotation to it until you read about it. And then you think, oh, right. my God, there's these, the, this, the horrors that happen there. Um, and then all of a sudden, yeah. Truman makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Well, wasn't yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, wasn't the Band of Brothers specific, um, specifically about the, the writings from Eugene Sledge? Yeah, he was one of the characters in that. I believe that whole series was a combination of uh, different yeah, memoirs. A few different or, ones. Or hmm. character. But Eugene Sledge is a character in the Pacific, and having just read that memoir before rewatching it again last year, I can say right. that it's pretty darn accurate. <laughs> That's cool. So, Matt, what's your favorite part of history to learn about? You said part of history, I, like, I say part. Um, Time period. I, I do big, I do a couple big periods. Of, I love the Bronze Age. Um, I love reading about the Bronze Age and um, imagining what life was like back then. And so that's why I write about things um, uh, in in that culture and society, uh, specifically like Mediterranean and Mesopotamian stuff, because uh, I want to, you know, to a certain extent, live there. Maybe not for the dentistry and the plumbing, but for other things. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I, uh, the bronze, I, I like human prehistory, the bronze age, second world war and ancient Rome. Like that's, that's so where I go. Human prehistory. Let's get it's into that for a minute, if you don't mind, because yeah. I, I find that subject fascinating. Absolutely. And we, you talked about on the discord a little bit, Graham Hancock, mm -hmm. his idea of human prehistory is probably different than the average person, right? The average all, archaeologist. Yeah. I love Grant Hancock. I've read all his books and, you know, interviews and watched a new series and also listened to his critiques. Um, but uh, I think a very flippant way of describing Grant Hancock's possible view of pre human prehistory would be like the Jetsons. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I think when people say uh, an, ex an, an advanced civilization prior to recorded history, they think advanced civilization starting from today when that's not what it mm -hmm. meant back then, right? So yeah. um, further at, than they were then. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, generally. I think if you look at things like Gobekli Tepe, um, that reset the clock on history as what as far as what people were capable of building, um, mm -hmm. passing on for information and the societal cohesion needed for such a project and more being discovered in that area, then it does have to give you a different view of what was possible back then. I am a proponent of the Younger Dryas Comet impact theory. You know, I, I know that there are certain things about it and certain things, um, there are certain things about it that, you know, they're saying to disprove it and, and other things. But I think that the, the fact that they, the flood myth is so prolific across cultures that had no contact with each other, that there's yeah. got to be something there. And a very well, unnatural. <clears throat> I, I would like to, let's dive into that for a second because I've been thinking about that. And one thought I had is, well, what if that th flood myth just goes back to when, let's say, 60, 70,000 years ago, there were just one or two tribes, and there was a local thud, flood, and the stories of that passed down, and that's why it's in every, in every society. Spoken so word, you know— very good I'm just point. curious. It's something that seems like it's possible. Which is why I look at the actual sources for it and see which ones would have had contact or um, literary or historical transference. Like we can draw a line from the Epic of Gilgamesh to Egypt, you know, to uh, Egypt, to Judaism, to Christianity, to the Flood Like we can do that. That can all be the right. same stuff, right? They use There's language and all that kind of stuff, right, yeah, to, to follow are, that. Others from around the world. I don't have a list of them in my head right now. Sure. There, there's enough of them out there that like maybe something big happened, and, and that we shouldn't view the entirety of human prehistory through the lens of Grant Hancock. Just right, reading about cavemen is fascinating to me. It's difficult to do so. Mm -hmm. It's mostly anthropology and, and historical sociology. Um, but again, in 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 the face of a lack of more evidence and stories than we might like to enjoy. I, I write about that stuff, and so I do a ton of research on it. There's college lectures about that kind of thing. There's anthropology books. Uh, this new book sure. just came out about Neanderthals called Kindred, which is excellent. There's one called Them and Us, 
which is about our relationship with some of our closest cousins, the, the, the Neanderthals. There is some historical fiction, uh, like kind of the cave bear and stuff like that, but not enough. And and I do incorporate historical fiction into my writing, my science fiction. Cool. Now, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to add, like, like what happened to Neanderthal man? I mean, that that's the question, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> a common, are you saying why are the, why did they disappear? Right. I, I don't think they. Well, I mean, yeah, they didn't disappear really. I mean, they got they got bred out, assimilated. Yeah, I think they assimilated. I would say a combination of fighting and, and interbreeding. Yeah. Well, or out competed, right? Right. Human, modern humans were better suited for certain environments, and they were able to out compete Neanderthals in a changing climate. And they also interbred. Yeah. But, right. But when you look at the DNA evidence for how much they interbred, it seems like, at least this is what I was reading in that book, Blueprint, it's not very much DNA. So it seems like they weren't doing well. There's more, I can't remember the exact reasons they said, but Neanderthals were already pretty low percentage. Sure. But by that point. But, you know, here, here's the, you know, you can even look at like modern. Uh, uh, well, well, you could say modern sexual preferences. So you have, you know, a large, a larger, stronger species. Stop it! I'm just getting so, ready to pull your foot out of your mouth. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, I mean, I'm just getting ready. I'm yeah, just gonna just yeah. <laughs> pull it right out of your mouth because I yeah. feel like I feel it coming. So you have a longer, you have a larger, stronger species, physically stronger species, and you have a more intelligent species. We don't know that, but I mean, we don't know that Neanderthals weren't. As intelligent as humans, we don't know. They How could larger, we know? Didn't they have larger they, brain? They had a larger brain, but just because yeah. you have a larger right. brain, right? But just because smarter. they have a larger brain doesn't mean they weren't smarter. We're More assuming that. humans are smarter because one, oops, yeah. <laughs> because we won. We're assuming we're smarter, but we don't know. Well, if you're looking for a okay, so we're gonna go. This is if you're looking for a mate, okay. What are you going to go based on? You're going to go like even even today's state, like even today. OK, whatever. No, no, I love it. Go down the rabbit hole. Say what you want to say. So even, some of the best parts of our show is when you say something ridiculous. Well, I'm not saying something. Ridiculous. No, please do. I don't. So care. when it comes to mates, I mean, you can look at mate, like dating now. A lot of women like like stronger like dominant males of course okay but that that's how that's the breeding process like you right want even if it's subconscious you want to to breed with somebody that you're going to produce the best offspring even if it's subconscious. most of the time it's most of the time i mean that that's just how it is i mean even we're, mm -hmm. we're all animals i mean so we're trying to pick the best person that you know is attractive. Gives our genes the best chance of survival. survival going forward. Yeah, that's how evolution works. Yeah, I understand. I'm, no, I'm agreeing with you. The point. I'm agreeing with you. I'm not. Yeah. So your thought there had to tie this in. Then you're thinking that female hum Homo sapiens were attracted to Neanderthal men. I think that's because of the not what the problems. DNA says. Because I the think the DNA says that most of our Neanderthal DNA came from the females in the species. Interesting. So that so the, the, so the, the females were picking a smarter or more the Homo sapiens were doing capturing. better. Capturing I, I, is maybe one possibility, or out competing because they had more resources, they had, were doing better, so the females were more attracted to them instead of the Neanderthals. It could be either. What happens when you kill off all the males in a competing tribe? The females are left, right? That, I'm gonna that's part them. of it. I'm going to take your uh, thought a step farther, Scott, and say that, uh, you know, women are, you know, naturally attracted to uh, the type of man who will best be able to protect them and survive in a certain environment, right? And historically, historically, right? Especially in previous right. uh, Maybe not so nowadays, but, you know, that kind of thing still kind of thing. It's right into us. Um, it just depends on what traits and attributes allow you to be dominant effective competent um in, uh, exceeding in 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 survival and if that is only hunting and bashing people over the head and being strong <laughs> sure but humans as george is saying adapted you know what i mean we are better at adapting to different environments and that would have been the trait to select for at a certain point this was, and i this feel was like, like sorry go ahead keep going oh, just really just really quick yeah just um 
this reminds me of a story that Frank Herbert wrote. It's a short story. It's in his um, collection of short stories called I. And it's about these early hard scrabble colonizers of an exoplanet. Okay. And there's a hmm. woman, she, they, they all get to select their mates. You know what I mean? And there's a woman who's a scientist and she has like all these degrees and she's a planetary scientist and she's an ecologist or whatever. And for her mate, she selected the simplest um and really kind of maybe though not most intelligent male but he just understood how the plants work there he had a bond with the land and he and her friends were like why did you choose that guy but that was the trait that would have allowed them to survive on that planet <laughs> because he could cultivate food because he would keep her offspring alive yep right. well her and her offspring right and that that's in all of us okay that's your favorite part of history. I find most of Bronze Age prehistory. One more prehistory question because I, I it just is something I've been thinking about a lot. Sure. Mo- anatomically modern humans, at least seventy-five thousand years. Some people I think yeah. push it back all the way to like three hundred thousand years. Yeah, two hundred, three hundred thousand years. And that's that's not only mo- you know when you're t- speaking anatomically, that's the actual actual brain. Too, yeah. Right. That's those are people that are just as smart as anybody alive nowadays. What they don't have is presumably the ability to pass on knowledge as easily as we do because of written word. And they also didn't have as many of them. So you're just going to come up with less geniuses. When you have seven billion people, you're going to get a higher a number of geniuses even if the percentage is the same so but my thinking there is what amazing things happened that we don't know about just because it was so damn long ago so much you know isn't that a fun topic to to wrap your brain around the vast the vast gulf of what we have lost is staggering to me i try to imagine it um i try to extrapolate imagine assume and write uh, accurate depictions of what life was back then to connect our, ourselves to the past that we have lost right so yeah go ahead well one question i have is now that we have this overabundance of information and ease of access it seems like a lot of people aren't using that tool in my opinion no you're right it he- seems like we you know we're so used to you know, having every you, you want to learn how to build a cabinet, you can go on YouTube right now and learn how to build a cabinet in 15 minutes. Just watching somebody build, you know, right, yeah. watching a, a master carpenter build sure. cabinets. I mean, I've literally done that. Yeah, I, but I'm just saying, like, <laughs> it's it seems like a lot of people or at least modern society, at least modern Western American society. Uh, it seems like a lot of people aren't utilizing the tools because before you had to go read a book or you had to find, you know, you had to go find something about cabinet making. You didn't have somebody showing you what tools and how oh, to use them. I don't know, man. I think people use YouTube for that kind of stuff every I, day. I think some people. I think probably more people than don't. Uh, but you, yeah, I mean, there's always going to be I can people, give you anecdotal evidence to the sure, contrary. Sure, but there's always going to be people who don't. <laughs> That's human nature, yeah, right? Yeah, but. Okay, even like, you know, people, let's say 10 years younger than me, and they ask me how to do something, and I go, well, you have a phone that's connected to the Internet, which has pretty much the wealth of information, like of all of human history. I mean, even modern, say, they just don't use it. It's a tool but, that they're not utilizing. But if you know how, that's still much better than Googling it. Because what they have when they ask you is a source of trusted information. Sure. When they try to YouTube it, you will find videos that are crappy. You will find people who say they know something and they don't. Uh, That's fair. So it's actually smarter to first ask people you know. Uh, Fair. And then after that, go to the internet. I I just, like I said, well, you were talking about the transfer of of information and knowledge. And that's that's just one thing I find interesting when when somebody asks me how to do something. And it's like, well, you have the the entire breadth of human knowledge at your fingertips that, yep. that's all but but the best is still information from a trusted source that's fair i'll go with you on that so have you ever matt have you ever found yourself hoping for an ice age just so we could find out the stuff that's buried under the water <laughs> that would we would now get to see like <laughs> i was just thinking about this the other day like think about it though right 
Beringia. Yep. Okay. Six or seven hundred miles wide. As big as Montana, this land bridge. Whole generations of people lived on that land bridge, not realizing it was a bridge. They were just making their way to the next good area of to live. Imagine, yep. okay. imagine those people. I do. Because they didn't know what was on the other side. There were large polar bears. Like they found, you know, this is this is yeah. pretty much archaeological evidence. There was like huge like bear tribes uh, uh, living uh, on the western side of that, and these people were just pushing forward. They were just exploring. The most intrepid mm -hmm. explorers of the human race. We split up. We said, "Hey, we'll meet you back around the other side of the world in a few thousand years, and we'll share some stories." But what did we do? We killed each other, right? But these yeah. these people, well, that's normal. Yeah, it yeah. is. These people were just pushing forward, pushing forward through the ice and the snow and, and the bears. And then they got to this paradise of game and 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 just you know wildlife and, and verdant mm -hmm. land. And then they were like, We made it. And these these are our ancestors. That is that is incredible. Um I, I want to just go back for a second to um learning things, how we learn them. Um, I believe the information is a bit of force multiplier for human creativity. I believe it depends on how you use it. I think the easy access of information has caused people to not want to learn things for themselves. I, at the same time, I think there's just a kind of person who will always do that for themselves. Um, we've traditionally passed down information, father to son, apprentices, and um, and occupations. But yeah. I, I, I but I, I do think that largely. Um, and let me let me preface this by a caveat. When you, uh, here's the how I how I kind of sum it up. When you, a lot of people just see someone on a phone and they assume they're texting on Facebook. You know, you look over at someone on the bus, they got the noise buried in the phone. They're like, look at that guy. He's not even paying attention to the world around him. He might be reading a book. He might be learning a new language. You don't know. He might be writing a book. I write on right. my phone. If you're telling me I'm wasting my time with my nose buried in my phone, I'm going to tell you off. At the same time, I believe that uh, largely we don't have to work for our achievements so much anymore, and that makes them much more easy to ex exploit and use for bad purposes. True. I feel like one of the things that we'll probably lose sight of when we focus on the negative aspects of this technology is all of the absolutely positive benefits of that technology. There are so many people that can now do the thing that they're best at because of technology or follow their passion while also having a regular job and probably living a more fulfilled life because of that. Absolutely. Like we're, we're in that boat, by the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's like my, you know, Leslie's, my wife's grandmother, she, has friends on Facebook in Germany. She's been gone from Germany since she was 20. And she oh, gets amazing. to communicate regularly in German with people she knew from when she was 15 so because of Facebook. And there was no way they would have ever found each other before that. Right. That's awesome. That's a, it's brought connections back into my life as well. People I thought I'd never see yeah. again and I found there it, it, it truly is amazing amazing it just depends on what you do with it that's all it is yeah it's just like any other technology right you think about the shakeup that was caused by the printing press yeah and we're still kind of living in that chaos yeah and then we throw into that chaos the internet yeah. can we survive that as a species in a civilization i don't, I don't know we're going to struggle through it. We're going to figure it out. We're going to see all the bad stuff. We're going to see all the positive things. It's or we all weird. die. Yeah, or we all die. <laughs> it's possible. I, I, I don't think I, this. I don't think so either, but I think it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but think about the printing press, right? If you don't have the printing press, do you have fascism? Do you have communism? Especially, probably you don't have communism. Do you have the French Revolution? Do you have the American Revolution? Do you have... The Protestant uh, Reformation, all of these things that upended society as they knew it at the time. Now, that society would have been changed anyway because that's human nature, but it would have changed differently and probably much more slowly than it did because of the printing press. And then Absolutely. what is the Internet except the printing press on steroids? Absolutely what it is, yeah. 
Well, and that, that's the other the other question is, and if if you notice, like the the speed of change lately, maybe for us as we're getting older, like it seems like it's it's you know a lot faster, and maybe it is a lot faster, and it is a lot faster. I don't know if to, it is or not. Well, I, I think compared to to one hundred and twenty years ago, yes, but to compared be, to sixty years ago, I don't know. To be completely honest, I I believe that technology is being throttled. Um, and not up, I think down. I think technological. They're effects, slowing it down on purpose. Yeah, they're slowing it down on purpose so that the, the the population can keep up with it, because it's just impossible. I mean, if if they released, uh, I don't know. I, you you know what? That's not a ludicrous thing to think. But, well, that's I, 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 I believe I'm saying, that's true. I, I, I what I'm saying is ludicrous. I don't think you're ludicrous for thinking that. It, it's totally possible. Well, you have to. When you went from the Wright brothers to landing on the moon in 60 years, or, or the Wright that's brothers insane. To the F, yeah, the Wright brothers to the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter in a little over 100 years is, is just it's, yeah. It's, or or it's the not, SR-71 in 70 years, which makes even no. I mean, the SR-71. That's it's crazy to me that the SR-71 was in the 60s. Yeah. Think about that. That plane is insane still. So then, so it is. I think it probably has slowed down a little bit, or it's 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 technologies went micro. I, I think it's the, microchips yeah. instead of big things. No, so it feels like it's slower, but maybe it's not. I still think there are big things. We just don't know about them. It's That's just awesome. like I said, it's being throttled down. The information, is, the information is vast, but the amount they can release at one time. Which well, brings us to is, the alien conversation. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the next. Matt, one. do you have any thoughts on the alien combination conversation? What'd you say? I said I almost went there. Almost no, go. Oh, let's do that. So, did you see Dan's Substack? Did uh, you see his uh, Substack article? Do you have a chance to read? Yeah, yeah I read that article. Yeah, that was interesting. I just, I just do you have go back thoughts about it, or do you want to not? We don't have to talk about it if it didn't interest you that much. I no, no I, I'm definitely willing to talk about UIPs. Let's let's just, just really quick. You're talking about limiting technology, what it's used for. What drives progress? Um, necessity and commerce, right? Yep. So, like a necessity, an example of necessity is warfare. Hence, all the military vehicles you were just referencing, or we were just referencing. Um, commerce, the micro—that's the big thing. Commerce, the small, the mm -hmm. micro side of things, the apps, the the little personal gadgets, things like that. And that's just money, you know what I mean? And that's where we bury our noses in the phone and don't do anything useful with our lives. Um, right. So when we're seeing about what of what products are being produced and allowed to us. Really, we just have to see what is necessity or making what is necessary in the world or what is making money, really, you know? Yeah. That, that, I mean, um, I used to work in the – go ahead, sorry. I was about to jump into UFOs. What, what, oh, what, go ahead. Uh, sorry. I can Go ahead, man. <laughs> Scott used to work on UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> His grandmother was a UFO in the Second World War. That's, That's true. true. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Dan, Dan How did you know that, to... Matt? That's fascinating that you were able to figure that out. I Dan, that stuff Dan's is. Are... Do you Dan's think? Are... No, you go ahead. Dan, uh, Dan's article was interesting. One of the points I took away with from that is it, it was a bit of speculation. He's like, you get hopeful, you think this will break through, but then you. He's very much a realist and a pragmatist and a practical person, and he does not have an optimistic view of, I would say, human nature, um, or or future of humanity. And when it comes to things like a, the government telling us the truth, or b, them, you know telling us the truth about what is about what we're seeing we're in the, in the news, news right now or right now or maybe, um allowing uh, us to learn anything that may happen in the future is that it'll probably fall out into nothing again why should we get excited yeah it, it, it's like don't get your hopes up because we really still haven't gotten any real evidence all he all that david gorsh testified to was people told me they saw this people told me they saw that when they start having people on that testify i saw this yeah. I saw that. That's when it gets interesting to me. There's the guy with the gimbal video who was the pilot from the Nimitz, and that was pretty compelling. There's evidence on there. There's video yeah, on but that. that's still not crashed no. UFOs. That's not unidentified. Crashed. That's really truly unidentified phenomenon. 
right? Oh, yeah. The the tic tac and and that stuff, right? Those are those are some kind of phenomenon, right? But what Gorsh was talking about was more like Roswell, right? Yeah. I would love to know if that was real or not. And his testimony does nothing to tell me whether or not it was real because it was more, I heard that we have these things. I heard that people found alien bodies. I need actual witnesses or real hard evidence before I'm going to get excited. I would love to know the truth. I don't know that we'll ever know the truth. I hope we do. Maybe we already do, and it's bullshit. <laughs> it's well, just one of those things that because you can't know it, you really want to know. Yeah. Like history, like prehistory. So this mm -hmm. is what sparked me thinking about that was um, you mentioned the SR-71 Blackbird, and then you know a lot of people say, look at all these remarkable technologies we came out so quickly. The 60s. How do we have that? Oh, it must have been us reverse engineering some form of advanced technology. But really, technology builds on technology, progress builds on progress, and we went forward in exponential leaps. Um, I don't think we give enough credit to this to the intelligence of humans as far as being able to innovate and invent when we are unleashed, when we are unleashed or you know with just funding um, uh, or propelled by warfare. Um, when there's and a necessity, and so you get the funding, you don't get the bureaucrats staying in your way like what happens most of the time. You got, you get, like you said, you get people that are throttling progress, but I don't think those in that situation, the people that are throttling progress, it's not intentional. There's also that about a part of human nature that is slow down, change is bad. And there's a reason that evolved in us. Some of us have that. And that's because that allows us for us to survive in certain situations too or right? to maintain what, the status quo until we die <laughs> which, is, which is also beneficial in certain environments oh yeah you yeah. know I, okay matt if somebody was going to read do you, are your books available in in written form too or are they only podcast form yeah, so um, I have a collection of short stories on Amazon. It's called Fictionalia, and there are standalone short yeah. stories and sample chapters yeah. from a recently yeah. completed novel yeah. called Max Humana. Um, I'm having difficulty publishing it because it's an extremely long, epic work, and um, it's, it's, I have to like kind of build a career to get my name out there first. So I'm working on that, but there are sample chapters available. Um, and and uh, the print version of those short stories and sample chapters is available under the name Fictionalia. Okay, so if you were going to point somebody to read or listen to the best thing you've ever done, where should they go to find that? Uh, my website, MatthewBella.com, and the sample chapter from Pax Humana called A Millennium's Children. Okay, I'll check that out. A Millennium's Children, that's the thing you're most proud of writing. Yes, so sir. that's a – read that to get a good idea of what it is that you do. Absolutely. Cool. Perfect. That's great. Okay, so then I've decided – well, we've decided one of the ways we're going to start wrapping up these episodes is talking about interesting things that we have read or listened to recently, which we cool. did on the recent episode. So, Matt. You talked about that podcast um, that is on the Discord channel, the 98-year-old gentleman. But what else? What else have you been reading or listening to lately that you think other people would like? Uh, I just started uh, just, uh, uh, reading The Dawn of Everything, Dawn of which everything. is sort of a work of uh, re um, uh, revisionist historical sociology. It directly refutes, which is controversial, the works of Pinker and Rousseau. I can speak intelligently about Pinker, not so much about Rousseau. But um, um, there's some interesting points in there. It, it was controversial when it came out, and some reviews caused me to put it off on the shelf for a while. But I've just now started again, and it's an, a massive work, but it's fascinating. Cool. So you said that was the dawn of everything? Yeah. Cool. Nice. Yeah. Um, man, I was just going to ask you a question about that. Something else now popped in my head. Anyway, Scott, what are you, what are you recommending? 
Uh, I'm not reading anything new right now. <laughs> right. Um, so you're still on Hard Luck Hank? And... Uh, no, no. Well, Hard Luck Hank I kind of washed out on because it, it started getting up. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to knock the, the author on that one. You just um, got away from the things you liked about it. Uh, yeah. Well, eh, that kind of happened with that Euphoria well, series to me. What, what happened, it, you know, this happens in audiobooks sometimes to save time and money. So what they do is they did like uh, – uh, if you say something like repetitively, like he said, like they, they just said he said, and then they just kept copying and pasting it in different parts of the book mm. to, to cut down on the reading time. Oh, that's annoying. Yeah. So there was no inflection. It changed it. And I just, so I they just did a shitty job yes. on the audio book. But I'm, I'm really waiting for uh, uh, Dungeon Crawler Carl book six, which okay. is uh, an audio. I'm waiting for the audio book to drop. Uh, but other than that, I just, uh, <laughs> It's all been work lately, man. Sure. It's all work. Sure. Uh, what about you? For me, there are a few good uh, podcasts that I like that I didn't mention last time. So the Meat Eater podcast, I thoroughly enjoy. Okay. he That's Steve Rinella, and he has a bunch of different wildlife biologists. Sometimes he has authors on. He had um, – uh, th- uh, shoot, Ian Frazier on to talk about his book about Siberia and other books like that he wrote. That was fascinating. Well, but another cool one is the Bear Grease podcast, which is in the Meat Eater Podcast Network. He's done standalone uh, series about Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, and those were both fascinating. The one he's doing right now is about the Mississippi River, which – very interesting. So if you want to hear, those are more more of a studio produced podcasts that he that are on those ones. Those are their sound effects. You know, he does interviews and then patches them together with voiceover telling the story. So it's a higher production value, but very interesting. Like the Daniel Boone one was great. Another fascinating Bear Grease podcast episode uh, series that he did was about this undercover. Um, game warden who infiltrates this gang of poachers and and lives with them for like two years in the 70s, right? And then busts the guy who is his best friend. <laughs> it's amazing because he gets – he does – he talks to this guy who wrote a book about it. He talks to him. There's two episodes about that. And then after that, those episodes comes out. The guy who he busts reaches out and is like, I'll talk to you. So then he talks to the friend who was betrayed by this guy that was his best friend for two years. That's messed up. And and it was it was fascinating. And so that's the Bear Grease podcast. You go back. That was near the beginning of the, when those started coming out. But, I mean, it's amazing. That's what I love about podcasts and stuff like that because where would the market be for that? before this yeah it would have to be in a book but when you can hear somebody tell you their story in their own words it's much more impactful right and we have that technology now so why not yeah so matt one more question that occurred to me when you were talking historical fiction are you into historical fiction absolutely bernard uh uh well bernard cornwall do you like him um did he write it what he had the Saxon Chronicles where he he does the the literally one of his series is is about England, like the King Arthur times. Another series he did is when the Vikings are coming over and and fighting you know the the Anglo's for mm-hmm. control, and then he has one that is the Stark series, which is starts in India and goes all the way up through the American revolution. Okay. And they're really interesting and they're fun because what he does is he goes over to this, he'll go do all his research, like a tremendous amount of research about a subject. And then once that's done, then he tells the story by making a main character that is fictional, that is side a side part of the story, right? So he's not King Arthur. It's King Arthur's buddy. Yeah. You know? And so he tells that whole, you learn so much about history from reading his novels 
like the battles he does are real. Those are real battles. The strategy that happens are real. The characters are all real except that main character. Okay. So I find those to be a really interesting read. If if you love history, those are a good way to learn it. That's a good one. And one actually that I all uh, historical fiction that I just started reading is Essex Dogs. Essex, like the you know the country in England. It's about a group yeah. of missionaries during the Hundred Years' War fighting in France, and it was written by Dan Jones, who is a, a, a historian. Really, really excellent cool. book. Yeah, I'll check that out. That sounds cool. You said A.P. Beswick, right? No. Oh, Bernard Cumber. Um, sorry, oh. I always mess it up. What'd you say? The other, the other one is the Sharp series, which was made into a series, a TV show starring uh, Sean Bean. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love that show so much, and I started reading the books on that. Yeah, I love that stuff. Okay, and then last question, Matt, favorite science fiction novel? Dune. 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 Dune's a good one. Yeah. That's a good, good pick. <laughs> yeah. Nice name drop. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, thanks for joining us, Matt. Um, we really appreciate it, and uh, we'll definitely have you on again because this has been fun. Yep. Thanks for having okay. me on the show. You guys yep. are great. We'll talk to you on the see, see on the Discord. Yeah. Don't forget the link to the Discord channel will be in the description and also the link to the old Hardcore History episodes, and uh, these will also be on YouTube. So thanks again. You bet.